go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke chapter 24 and verse 47, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You could go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But ye shall be witnesses unto me, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth and many other places that tell us, that command us to go soul winning. But here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, we are told some things that we are not supposed to do in soul winning. We're, we're supposed to go, but there's a certain way that we're supposed to go and certain ways that we're not supposed to go. And uh, what we're going to cover this morning, uh, if you need a title for the topic for your notes sake, is the don'ts in soul winning. The don'ts in soul winning. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look first of all at verse number 16. But... Shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. That's something you don't want to do in soul winning, is get involved in vain and profane babblings. Then look down at verse number 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And so I want to talk to you this morning about the don'ts in soul winning, and just kind of give you a list of things and uh, elaborate on them just a little bit as time permits, and probably won't get all 32 done, but... We'll do the best we can. I'll let Dr. Lewis know that we only got three or four of the 32 done. And number one, don't argue. This is when you're at the door. Obviously, we've talked about before the approach to the door, how to enter into a soul winning conversation, how to present yourself and uh, be respectable and friendly and all that. So we've talked a lot about the do's in soul winning. So this morning, the don'ts in soul winning. Number one, don't argue. You don't get anywhere arguing. You're not going to argue anybody into heaven. You're not going to convince anybody against their will to get saved. And, and even if you badger them to the place where they uh, pray a prayer with you just to get you off their front porch or, or out of their face and off their property, then you still haven't won a convert. And uh, you may end up winning the argument. I mean, after all, you should have truth on your side, amen? If you're, if you're saved and they're lost, you have the Bible, you know something about the Bible, you, you should be able to win the argument, but you're not going to win the soul. And you may have just closed the door for anybody else to win that soul because the person who should have been a prospect for salvation gets the attitude that all Christians are arrogant and argumentative and think they know everything and uh, they don't believe anything I say. They think I'm stupid. So you just don't argue. You create a barrier between the sinner and yourself. And you don't want to do that. The idea is to tear the barrier down. You know, people, when they see us on their, on their doorsteps anyway, they come to the door with their guard up, with their defenses up. And you have to be able to get around that or get beyond that, get them to drop their guard a little bit before you can uh, get in there with the gospel and, and make any progress. So uh, some people want to be argumentative, and the devil puts them up to, to trying to steer you in the direction of, of a confrontation or an argument. Just be wise and, and stay away from that. You just don't argue. You just sometimes, you know, if I'm a guest in somebody's home, and I'm thinking of a particular father-in-law right now who will remain unnamed, but a uh, very good man, but very strongly opinionated. But I happen to think that some of his opinions aren't right. But I'm a guest in his home, and he's much older than I am, and he is the, the father of my wife. So I'm respectful of him when he says something that I think is absolutely stupid. I just smile and nod. I don't say anything. I just, just kind of condescendingly give him a grin and, and nod a little bit. What do you think about that? And I say, well, you know, how about them bears, huh? <laughs> you know, just change the subject. Don't argue. Try to stay on track with the gospel. Don't get, in, don't get sidetracked into arguments and, because basically at the time that you enter into the argument, you've, you've exited the soul-winning conversation, and, and you're, from that point on, you're wasting your time. So you don't argue with people. Second thing, don't talk over people's heads. Don't use these big theological words that you don't even understand what they mean. You just heard Pastor Carter say it and it sounded good. Amen? Don't, don't use language when you're dealing with a lost sinner that they don't understand. The doctrine of justification and predestination and propitiation. You've got to know all these things. They don't have to know any of that to get saved. And so you don't use those big theological terms that, that lost people, most saved people don't understand, let alone somebody that's never heard the gospel before and that, that's lost without Christ. So you don't, you don't talk over their heads. You don't use these big theological words. 
I've seen soul winners waste all their time trying to get some lost person straightened out on the King James Bible. That's a big waste of time. Inspiration and preservation is not the issue when you're dealing with a lost sinner. It's all about salvation, amen? And you can keep that plain enough they can understand it. Well, that Bible you use, that's not based on the Westcott and Horton, the Masoretic text. That's the critical Alexandrian Westcott and Horton. So what, man? This person's going to die and go to hell, and you've convinced them that the King James Bible is the Word of God, but you still haven't convinced them that Jesus Christ is their Savior. And that's what's important. Worry about the other things afterwards. Um, you know, Ryan went out fishing the other day down at Lake Eva, and did you ever figure out how much that bass weighed? It's about three pounds. It was a good-sized bass. He, he was proud of it, man. He put it in a Walmart bag and brought it around, showed everybody, brought it in my office. And I said, I said, man, the guys in the dorm are going to eat good tonight. He said, no, they're not. This is for me. Amen. <laughs> but, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't clean that fish till he caught it. So what are you doing trying to clean up a lost sinner before you catch one? You know, you've got to get the fish into the boat before you can bring them home and do anything with it. And so trying to get some lost guys straightened out on, on the King James Bible, that's not his need. You know, there are a lot of Christians who are having a hard time getting straightened out on the King James Bible. And put first things first, your priority, the only thing that you'll be doing when you go out tonight or Tuesday night or Wednesday morning or Saturday morning or just in your day-to-day -day life when you're witnessing to people for Christ, witnessing to lost people, trying to win them to Christ, the only thing you're concerned with is the salvation of their soul. You don't get into these big theological debates and use this kind of theological language that they're completely unfamiliar with anyway. So don't talk over people's heads. Don't use words that they don't understand. Charles Spurgeon, who was a master orator, master of the English language. I read Spurgeon and I read his sermon in one hand and with a Webster dictionary in the other hand so I can keep up with what he's trying to say. But Spurgeon, in spite of his, of his extensive vocabulary and massive understanding and usage of the English language, wisely made this statement, there was no particular virtue in being seriously unreadable. And now apply that to soul winning. There's no particular virtue. There's no virtue at all in being seriously ununderstandable. If I can explain it all to you, if I stood here today and, and taught this lesson completely in Chinese, how many of you would understand it? First of all, I wouldn't, but then if I could speak Chinese, you might be impressed with my knowledge of the Chinese language. But this lesson hasn't helped you at all. And you may think you're impressing somebody, some lost person, with all your knowledge of the deep things of God. But you haven't helped them. They're still going to die and go to hell if they don't trust Christ as Savior. That's, that's the key. That's got to be the focus. Next thing, don't talk down to the sinner. Don't talk down to the sinner. Don't be self-righteous and pharisaical. Don't come across as, I'm saved, you're not. I'm a better person than you are. A lot of people get that idea anyway that we're coming across that way and even we purposely try not to. I've heard people tell me, oh, you think you Christians are better than everybody else? And I say, no, we're just better off. But what I like to do when I'm soul winning, for instance, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says all have sinned. That means everybody, right? That means I'm a sinner. Put, put the emphasis on yourself first. You're not, that means you're a sinner. Oh, and you're not. No, don't talk down to people. Put yourself in it first. That means I'm a sinner, right? Because the Bible says everybody. Well, if, if the Bible says all have sinned, that makes me a sinner. What does that make you? Now we're on the same level. And keep it that way to where you, you can relate to that. Romans 3.10, for there is none righteous, no, not one. The word righteous means perfect. God says nobody's perfect. That means I'm not perfect. Put it on yourself first. So now, okay, I'm not talking down to this guy anymore. He doesn't perceive that I'm talking down to him, that I'm elevating myself above him because I'm, I'm a Christian and he's not. We're on the same level here. I'm not perfect. Are you? I'm a sinner, aren't you? That's what the Bible says. So, so deal with it that way. Don't talk down to people. Don't act self-righteous and pharisaical. Don't come across as, as thinking that you're better or trying to convincing that person that you think that you're better than they are. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Good people die and go to hell without Christ. Decent people, moral people, Republicans even, die and go to hell without Christ, amen, if they're not saved. And um, we're in that category. Had it not been for Jesus Christ, we'd be just as lost as the lost people we're talking to. We'd be just as much in danger of hell as what they are. 
And so keep keep that in mind as you're dealing with somebody. And it's always best to, to now you want you want them to feel the heat as well. You want the Holy Spirit to get in there and start working. And um, I've gotten to Revelation 21, 8 in the Bible explaining that to somebody and watch this person break out in a sweat as it starts to become real to them. But I want to put myself in there too. I, you know, before I came to Christ, I was in the same predicament, man. I, I was facing that same hell. And uh, so don't talk down to people. Don't, don't act all self-righteous and pharisaical. Uh, next thing, don't chase rabbits. Preachers are famous for that. I'm not famous at all, but if I were famous for anything, it would probably be for that. I get preaching, and I get off on some tangent, some rabbit trail, and I chase it down the, down the trail, and then all of a sudden I stop and go, what was I talking about? <laughs> What's, what was this message I was supposed to be preaching anyway? And it's easy to do that in soul winning. Don't get sidetracked. Don't chase rabbits and, and get off in the areas that uh, don't have anything to do with your, your uh, soul winning presentation. You're there on, on the Lord's business. And the Lord's business is preaching the gospel to every creature. And you ought to be prepared before you get there. That's why it's good to find a plan that you can work with and then work your plan. Now, there are different means of going about it. I think I mentioned in here before that um, at one time when I had some time on my hands, you know, in evangelism, you can just hang out at the motel and sleep all day and, you know, just go preach at night and they take you out to eat after church and they drop you off at the motel and they don't bother with you. It's not really that way, but, you know, if it were that way, you know, back in the days when I had a little bit more time, I was going to put together a book called, you know, The Gospel According To, and I was going to go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And I believe that maybe with only a couple exceptions that you can actually map out the, the plan of salvation from every book of the Bible. There's a consistent truth. There's a consistent message there. The, the four major truths that everyone's a sinner, there's a penalty for sin, Jesus Christ paid the penalty for sin, and by receiving him as Savior, you can have that penalty of sin removed from you and be saved and go to heaven. I think you can find those four basic elements in most, if not all, the 66 books of the Bible. But I don't go soul winning saying, well, I wonder what gospel I'm going to use at this door. Well, see, I haven't tried Exodus in a while. Let's do that. Or you find out who you're talking to. Well, this, this person, Jeju, they don't believe the New Testament, so let me go back to you know, the gospel in, in Leviticus and try that one because this guy's a Jew. Or, you know... Get a plan that works and then work the plan. So, so you are prepared. And you don't want to come across mechanical. We talked about that last time. And you don't want to get to where you're relying completely on the fact that you have this thing so memorized you can do it forwards and backwards and unconsciously. You still want to be prayed up and trust the Holy Spirit. But you do know what you're prepared to do and you want to be prepared when you get there. So now it's a surprise to the person that you meet at the door. But don't let it be a surprise to you what you're going to say. Man, you know ahead of time. And so that way you're not, you're not sidetracked, you're not grasping at straws what to say next. I, I have basically just a, a routine that I've used for years that, that works when I talk to somebody and I ask them, you know, if something were to happen to you and you died right now, do you know for sure that you go to heaven? And they say, well, yeah, I, I, I believe I would. And I say, well, how do you know that? Because, you know, they'll give me their answer. And, um, you know, well, is that all that, that you're trusting? Is all, that's all you think it would take to get a person to heaven? And, and until I get all their excuses out... And no matter what they say. Now, prior to that, I say, you know, um, do you have a, a church that you attend anywhere? We, we're not trying to necessarily pull people out of their churches if they go to a good church. But, you know, there are a lot of folks that don't go anywhere. And do you have a home church? And no matter what they tell me, well, I'm a Satanist. You know, I practice Wicca movement and sacrifice babies upstairs in the attic or something like that. Regardless of what they tell me, I don't have to go to my little cult book and find out what I'm going to say. Do you attend church anywhere? Whatever their answer is. You know, I'm a witch doctor from, you know, Kenya, and, you know, I put a curse on America, whatever they say. My response always is, well, it's important to go to church. That's a true statement. No matter what they say, I'm Catholic, I'm Jewish, I'm Jehovah Witness, I'm Mormon. Well, you know, it's important to go to church. But the most important thing is knowing for sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die. Now, that takes the bazillion and one responses, the possible responses that you can get, but I have one response to whatever response they have, and it fits every situation. If they tell me, well, you know, I'm a member of Landmark Baptist Church. I've been there for 25 years. I'm surprised you don't know who I am. Well, it's because when you sit on my side of the crowd and you're on the other side of the crowd, I never get over there, so I don't know who you are, amen, because the church is so big. But no matter what their response is, you ask them, do you attend church anywhere? Well, I have this or that. Well, it's important to go to church, but the most important thing is to know for sure that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. And then you don't have to worry about all the different ways you can get sidetracked and get messed up and have to get things back to the gospel. Just stay on point. Just stay on, 
that's the, the approach, the build up to getting to the gospel. And you don't have to deviate from that if you're prepared ahead of time. So don't chase rabbits. Don't get sidetracked in the midst of the uh, soul winning presentation. If you're showing them the scriptures and they ask you a question, and we talked about this some the other day, but just tell them, you know, well, what about, you know, this, what do you think about the election the other day? Well, you know, that's a good question. But if you let me uh, finish telling you about this first, then after I'm done, if you'll remind me, I'll try to answer that for you. And that works with any question, any, any divisive, sidetracking kind of an issue they come up. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about the, the Muslims? And, you know, uh, can Muslims go to heaven trusting Allah? Well, of course not, but don't stop in the middle of the Romans road when you're dealing with this lost soul about being saved to straighten them out theologically about Muslim beliefs. Well, you know, that's a good question. I used to wonder that myself, but, you know, let's take care of this first. And then after we're done, if you'll remind me, I'll try to answer that for you. Now, now in the first place, you've let yourself off the hook because it's up to them then in the end to remind you if you lead them to Christ most likely they're going to be too excited to worry about the question that they ask you to throw you off the track before and if they don't get saved most likely they're just going to be happy enough that you're leaving they're not going to want to remind you so you have to stay longer and answer their question anyway one danger and I heard a preacher give this testimony that if you just say well let me finish this first and then I will answer that for you the preacher went through the plan of salvation the guy didn't get saved the preacher and his partner left and they came back to follow up on the guy because he seemed like he was pretty open and the guy was very cold and unresponsive when he came to the door the second time and he looked at the preacher and he said you lied to me he said you told me you were going to answer my question when you got through with your thing and you never did you lied to me so just a simple easy way to, to put the responsibility on them if you'll remind me when we're through I'll try to answer that for you and, it, and the preacher wasn't purposely trying to lie to the guy. He just forgot. I mean, he got wrapped up in the gospel presentation. He's trying to win this guy. He's praying for him. He's, he's concerned about his soul. The guy said no. So, so he's thinking, man, this guy didn't get saved. It's, it burdened his heart, and he left. But he forgot that he would promised the guy in the middle of the conversation when the guy tried to get him off the track, I'll, I'll answer that for you when I'm done, and he never did. So be careful. That, again, it has to do with preparation ahead of time. And the devil may use that excuse that, that sends that guy to hell. Ultimately, there was a preacher one time who came by my house and lied to me. And he may never be open to the gospel again. So, so be careful about that. Yes, sir. Well, not really, because all you're doing is making a blanket statement it's important to go to church, which is true. Well, I know that, but I know what a church is, so what I'm saying is true. But then I'm moving beyond that. I'm not, getting, I'm not going to stop there and, and get in a debate about the merit of churches. Right. So but if a guy tells me he's a Mormon, he's a Satan worshiper, he goes to the Wiccan church, whatever, instead of, whoa, that's evil, that's sin, uh, and getting off on that, it's important to go to church. But the most important thing, and then I'm getting back on the gospel, it's more important, the most important thing is knowing for sure you're going to heaven. We've left the whole church issue behind. Okay, I know what you're saying, but we don't have enough class time to debate right here one-on-one, -on -one, okay? So we're just going to move on, okay? Let's get into the next one. Don't talk too fast. Don't talk too fast. Don't seem like you're an over-anxious, over-excited salesman at the door and make the guy all nervous and like you're in a big hurry and rushing and everything. So, you know, be friendly. We went out soul winning yesterday morning, and, and uh, Mickey joined Brother Gentry and I. We, we were down here on 4th Street, and uh, we only got one door knocked on because the guy came outside and sat on the porch, and I started talking to him, and he invited me to pull up a chair, and so I sat there, and we spent, we only have half hour, 40 minute break during choir practice anyway to get out and, and do that, and we spent the whole time right there. But I did get a chance to lead the guy to the Lord. That was a blessing, amen. Somebody say amen. That was exciting. That was exciting to me. But I wasn't in a big rush. Man, you know, we only got 30 minutes. We've got 20 doors to knock. I'd rather knock one door and win a soul than knock 30 doors and be in such a big hurry. Nobody responds, you know. So, and I realize, again, with the program on Tuesday and Thursday night, you don't have that luxury. But you may not have figured this out yet, but you're not bound to only go soul winning on the bus on Tuesday and Thursday night. It's a little bit different because you can't go in the house. You can't spend all the time that you might want to spend. It's more of a... Uh, pass out tracts, invite the church. If somebody's interested, you, you give them a quick witness and you have opportunities to win people, but you can't spend 30 minutes at the same door because there's about 35 other people waiting for you. But when it's you and your partner by yourself and it's not Tuesday or Thursday night, 
and you decide, hey, we're just going to go soul winning because it's the right thing to do, not because it's required for our Christian service report, and then you might only knock one door, and you can spend an hour there, you can spend two hours there, and you might not want to stay that long. We'll talk about that later, but you can spend as much time as you feel that you need to. I didn't rush that guy. He, every, every, I'd point out a scripture, and he'd start telling me about his mom in Michigan who was on dialysis. I didn't say, shut up and listen. This is important. I, I, never mind your mom that's dying of, of kidney failure in Michigan. This is more important. I sat there. I let him talk. I didn't engage in the conversation, all my infinite wisdom concerning kidney transplants and dialysis. But I just let him talk and, you know, sympathize with the guy. And then I said, okay, now the Bible says, and we got back to this. It took a little while. I couldn't rush the guy. He wouldn't let me. And so it, as long as it took, but I think it was worth the wait, amen? So, so you don't be so fast and, and start trying to trying to rush somebody just so you can get a quick decision. So, so I won't say a whole lot about that. Um, I like this one. Don't pray long prayers when you're with a sinner. This is from uh, Buddy Murphy, who was connected with Sword of the Lord, maybe, maybe still is, but a long time ago. But um, he wrote a lot and, and uh, preached a lot on soul winning. <coughs> And he said, I heard about one soul winner who prayed on and on and on. And when he got through, he found that the sinner had slipped out and stole his hat and his coat on the way out the door. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. Now, I got to the place and met this guy, Fred, on 4th Street yesterday. And I, I shared with him the gospel. And at the end of the gospel presentation, I asked him if, he, if he'd like to receive Christ as Savior. And he said, I would. How do I do that? And I said, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and you just, it's not the words that you say, and it's not just because you prayed a prayer, but you mean this with your heart. You, you believe what you're, what you're saying, and, and I pointed out Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that it's the belief in your heart that saves you. It's not the words that you say. And uh, I started praying for him, and, and I prayed first before I expected him to, you know, I was going to lead him in the sinner's prayer. And I said, Lord, thank you for allowing me to meet Fred today and spend some time with him and share the gospel with him. And I pray that right now he's opened his heart to Christ. And, you know, I got, I got done. I was about to lead him in prayer. He said, I can't pray that fast. He said, I, I can't keep up like that. And I said, well, Fred, I didn't expect you to. I was just praying for you. Now, here's what you're supposed to pray. But, you know, don't rush through it so fast that they can't keep up with you or anything like that. And don't just pray on and on and on. Uh, here's an important one. Don't be guilty of having bad breath or body odor. Don't be guilty of having bad breath or body odor. Make sure you take a bath before you go soul winning, amen? Make sure you brush your teeth or use mouthwash or have some Tic Tacs in your pocket or, or something. Now, you don't want to walk up to somebody's door chomping on a wad of gum and looking like a cow chewing a cud, amen? That's not all that attractive. Pastor Carter said the only difference between a teenage girl chewing a wad of gum in church and a cow chewing its cud is the intelligent look on the face of the cow, amen? <laughs> and there's a lot to that. But, you know, you can, you can pop a breath mint or a Tic Tac and, uh, you know, you get those little bottles of breath spray that Dr. Howells used to like that, Banaka. And uh, somebody at one of the question and answer sessions one time said, you know, Dr. Howells, that Banaka has alcohol in it. What are you going to do about that? And he said, drink it. Next question. <laughs> so, and you're not going to drink enough Banaka where it's going to, you know, you're going to get arrested for DUI or anything like that. But that's the kind of... Now, Gracie's being a blessing to everyone around her, amen, passing out the Tic Tacs. But, um, you know, you can get that little breast spray that you tap in your mouth or, you know, get a Tic Tac in between doors or something. But, you know, how are you going to win a soul if they can't even stand, to stand there and listen to you? They've got to hold their breath the whole time. <coughs> you know, that's, that's not a pleasant thing to do. Now, a lot of times we as soul winners get in situations where we almost got to hold our breath to be able to deal with the lost sinner. You can't help that. You just you go to people where they are, and, and you deal with people where they live, and sometimes it's unpleasant. I was preaching revival in Newburgh, New York, a number of years ago, and Newburgh, New York is sort of the ghetto attachment to New York City for the most part. And so this pastor who was starting a storefront church, they actually were meeting in a Grange Hall. It was more of a mission work to the inner city people there, and it was pitiful. I mean, we, we went soul winning in downtown Newburgh, and we'd walk up, on porches, you'd walk through the front yard and it was dirt with broken glass, that's where the babies played. And then we walked in the, the hallways of these apartment buildings and, and no doorknobs, just these big gaping holes in the doors where the doorknob ought to be, no security, no locks. You knock on the door and people invite you in and you walk in, you're stepping over dirty diapers and pet remains and things like that in the middle of the floor and heaps of garbage and the place stinks so bad and the roaches are climbing the walls and that's 
nasty. You got to hold your breath just to be in there. But you got to love people. You got to love sinners. And so, what do you do? You hold your breath the best you can, and you preach the gospel, amen. And, and you try to love folks and win folks. But don't you show up at their door in that condition? You know, take a bath. Make sure you don't stink. Make sure your clothes are clean. When I travel with Brother Coral, we train preacher boys every summer. And and big part of my job, since I was a little bit older, I was in my thirties when I graduated Bible college. And so a lot of young men, a lot of teenage boys in early 20s travel with us. And we would practice soul winning. We'd practice altar work, things like that. And some of these preacher boys would kneel next to me at the altar when they had to, to pretend like they were leading me to Christ at the altar in a service. And they'd breathe on me. And I promise you the soul winning was over. I'd get, at, I'd get a breath mint out of my pocket and hand it to them. And they'd say, oh, thank you. And I'd say, no, thank you. <laughs> Just please take it. So make sure that, that your body's clean, that your fingernails are clean, and, and fellas clipped. If you're not going to clip them, paint them, amen. And I don't recommend you do that either. But um, make sure your breath doesn't stink, you know, you're not offensive. And, and you may not know you have bad breath, but somebody else may just be too polite to tell you. So the best thing to do, whether you think you are afflicted with halitosis or not, is just carry some mints in your pocket or something or some breast spray and be prepared. Use some deodorant. There's a reason it's called deodorant, amen? <laughs> and be presentable. Again, it's just, it's offensive. Now, I, I, you know, I work there at the truck stop on the weekends, and I'm, I'm the cashier there in the convenience store on the graveyard shift on Friday and Saturday. And some of those people that come in, well, you get, you know, you can imagine the clientele you get between midnight and 7 a.m. anyway, especially 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And just, you know, people crawling in off the street in all kinds of conditions. The bars are closing up, and the Haines City Police Department's right across the road where, you know, the, the people get sprung from jail, and they've, they've confiscated their car, impounded it, and so they're coming over to make a phone call to get somebody to come pick them up, and, you know, there's just all kinds of bizarre things that go on. Some of these people obviously don't bathe on a regular basis. And now the counter at the truck stop between the cashier and the customer is, is at least this wide. But there's some times when I have a hard time reaching across the counter to get their money. I want to do it like this, you know, because it's just the stench and the breath and the ugh. You know, and at the truck stop, they have showers. And sometimes, you know, at McDonald's, the big push is you order a hamburger. Would you like fries with that? And a lot of times these, these truck drivers and these other people come in there and they smell so bad. And maybe all they want is a Coke and a hot dog. But I say, would you like a shower with that? You know, I don't say that, but I'm thinking that. You know, I'll give you one special tonight, free promotion, please. Just use soap. But, um... <laughs> So, and you and I will have that impression on other people if we're not careful. We don't take care of our, our cleanliness and our breath and our appearance, that kind of thing. So a lot of these are just common sense, but uh, common sense doesn't seem to be very common anymore, amen? So that's why we have to, you know, remind you of them. Next thing, don't preach denomination. Don't preach denomination. My name is Bill. This is my partner, Mickey. We're from Landmark Baptist Church. Why well, I'm a Catholic. Well, you know, Catholic theology is all messed up, man. Let me show you this. The Baptist Church is the church that the Lord Jesus Christ started. And your Methodist Church, man, that's a liberal apostate Protestant thing that came out of Catholicism back in the 1500s and blah, blah, blah. You're going soul winning. You're not conducting a door-to-door -door church history college level class, amen? So leave the denomination out of it. You know how Catholics get saved? By trusting Jesus Christ as personal Savior. You know how Baptists get saved? By trusting Jesus Christ as personal Savior. You know how Satan worshipers get saved? By trusting Jesus Christ as personal Savior. You're not there to convince them that your church is better than theirs. Now, if you're dealing with a saved person that has a good testimony of being saved, and they tell you, they have told you that, well, I go to the United Methodist Church in town, and you know that's a liberal apostate Protestant thing that started back in the 1700s when it came out of Catholicism. Maybe now you have, if, if you have time, again, I wouldn't do this on Tuesday or Thursday night soul winning, but if you go back to see that person when you have time to spend, you may get into a conversation about doctrine and about the difference in the churches and things like that because you're dealing with a child of God, a saved person. But dealing with a lost soul, trying to convince them that Baptist is better than Catholic is like trying to convince a lost person to adopt the King James Bible as the Word of God and they, and they die and go to hell with the King James Bible. And they can die and go to hell believing that the Baptist church is the right church that Jesus started too. But if they don't place their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that's, that's the whole point. So you don't preach denomination, don't argue about churches and things like that. Uh, don't let the prospect do the preaching. This is the next one. Don't let the prospect do the preaching. 
you need to be in control and maintain control of the conversation. That's why I'm giving you all this stuff about the answers. Now, to you and me, they're memorized pan, pat answers. You know, it's important to go to church, but the most important thing, knowing for sure you go to heaven, put church out of the way, get back on track, okay? Whatever their, their sidetracking questions are, that's a good question. I used to wonder about that myself, but let's take care of this first. If you let me finish, then if you remind me, I'll try to answer that for you. So you're putting all the obstacles out of the way. You are maintaining control. You are guiding this situation because ultimately you want to get to Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you not like right now to trust Jesus Christ as personal Savior, to call on the name of the Lord and trust Him to forgive your sins and come in your heart and save you? That's where we're headed. That's where we want to end up. So don't, get, don't let the person you're talking to steal the control of the conversation away. We've been out on Tuesday and Thursday night soul winning when I was in charge of the shuttle van thing riding around. And we've come around a corner and seen two of our college preacher boys standing there on the doorstep, found out later it was a Jehovah Witness, who had his Bible out and was preaching to the two soul winners. That's not what you're there for. You maintain control of the conversation. You don't let them start preaching to you. And if you find out you're wrapped up with some cultist that's not a, not a prospect, at least not tonight, because all they want to do is, you know, spout Jehovah Witness doctrine or Mormon theology or whatever it is, and you realize in short order this isn't getting anywhere, then just graciously excuse yourself, try to leave the door open for somebody else, and move on to the next door. Don't waste all your time standing there arguing with somebody that only wants to argue. You find people that are interested in listening to the gospel, and the key to listening is keeping your mouth shut. So if you come across a person who refuses to keep his or her mouth shut, you know you don't have a prospect tonight. If, if they want to dominate the conversation and take over and dictate to you the, how your time is going to be spent, move on. Hand them a track. God bless you. We'll be praying for you. Hopefully we can come by and see you again sometime. Move on. Don't get ugly. Don't get, you know, obnoxious or, or you know, insulting or whatever. Just graciously, graciously excuse yourself and move on. And that's the best thing you can do when you're, when you're, again, in a situation where time is of the essence and, and you can't stay there all day. And I don't like to stay all day in situations like that anyway. If I'm not dealing with a prospect and I know that and God has made it obvious to me this is not a prospect, at least not right now, I want to go find somebody that wants to hear. I would rather come back with rejoicing, bringing my sheaves with me and, and, and having had the, the privilege and the opportunity to, to tell somebody about Jesus and lead them to Christ and come back and tell somebody what a wonderful time I had arguing with the JW all night long. That doesn't do anything for my spirit. It just makes me matter. It doesn't do anything at all. It quenches the spirit. It certainly doesn't. It's not a blessing. Next thing. Don't, if you are, this is for the silent partner. Don't interrupt the presentation. If you are the silent partner, do not interrupt the presentation. You need to decide ahead of time whose turn it is to talk at the door. Now, if you are training a brand new soul winner, it could be that you do all the talking. There's nothing wrong with that. Nobody should have it to be their goal in life. Nobody should believe that God has called them to be the lifelong silent partner. Because the command is for all of us to be preachers of the gospel, for all of us to be witnesses. If it takes you a while to figure it out, that's fine. You know, if you're the soul winner, be patient with the person that you're training. But eventually they should be to the place where they can knock doors and, and initiate the conversation themselves. So you decide ahead of time who's going to do the talking. There's nothing more confusing than having two or three people standing on the doorstep talking to somebody and they're all talking at the same time. And a lot of well-meaning soul winners, they see that their partner is kind of flailing, he's, he's struggling with trying to communicate, so they just want to jump right in and take over. Well, just wait. If it gets bad enough, then most likely your partner's going to turn to you and say, help, you know, is there anything you can do here? And I've had them do that. Now, also, I was out soul winning with one man in a church in Pennsylvania that he had, his spiritual gift was making people angry. Amen? That's all he did from door to door. And he would get people red in the face and the veins sticking. And I'm standing there. I'm the silent partner. It's my turn just to be quiet. So I was doing that very well. So he gets this person so mad that he's trying to back up and slam the door. And, I mean, you can just tell, man, he's got his fist clenched and his teeth are clenched. And this guy's really got him riled up. And he turns to me, anything you want to add to that? And I said, no. And we left. You know, I'm not going to get into that, man. This guy's already to bite his head off. I'm not going to get bit too. But if you're the silent partner, the key word in silent partner is silent. Pray. 
cut off the obstacles. I was sitting on the porch with Fred yesterday. Fred's brother drives up. He gets out of the car. He's walking up the sidewalk. Guess what Mickey and Brother Gentry did? They cut Ralph off at the pass, and they're going to witness to him, talk to him. That's part of the duty of the silent partner. Run interference. You're talking to somebody at the doorway, and there's two or three little kids that are just going nuts, and they're, you know, they're grabbing on mom's skirt and you know, just screaming and yelling, breaking things. Well, if you can entertain those kids, get them kind of corralled, and you know, I don't know what you can do. Just roll around on the floor and let them pull your hair and you know, tear your clothes for a while or something, whatever they need to do. But the silent partner stays out of the conversation, runs interference when you see that. And i got a whole lesson I could give you on the silent partner, but... Uh, the key word is be silent. Don't interrupt if you're asked to participate. Now, here's another situation. It's my turn to knock the door. I go to the door. I'm standing there at the, at, in the front door, and, and Mickey's off the porch step behind me or something like that. I knock on the door, and the person comes to the door, and they act like I'm not even there, and they're communicating with him. They're, they just they make contact. Maybe they know each other. Maybe the person I'm talking to is closer to his age than my age, whatever it happens to be. And so they're talking to him. Well, it's foolish for me as the designated talker to stand there and try to butt in when he's making headway with these person he's talking to. So that's the wise time for me to step back, and I become the silent partner. And he can step up and take the lead. But now, now that I am the silent partner, I need to be silent. So, yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, in that case, yeah, you're the first one to make contact. So I mean, you know, you have to be adaptable. So these aren't hard and fast rules that are never violated because rarely will you have a soul winning experience that works out exactly as you are taught or, or practice in the classroom. So you have to be somewhat adaptable, but but principles that you operate by. And uh, again, if if you were the first person that this person coming out the garage contacted and you initiated a conversation then the person at the door, they, they kind of shrink back and they become the silent partner. They pray and they watch for interference and, and things like that. And uh, so you need to be wise about that. But again, to have a silent partner that won't keep their mouth shut doesn't help a whole lot. And don't be the silent partner all the time. You know, you need to uh, make an agreement ahead of time. We'll knock every other door. I'll, I'll go until I get to talk to somebody. And then you go to you get to talk to somebody. And that's ordinarily how I like to do it because otherwise it ends up being that I don't get to talk to anybody because every door I knock on nobody's home and my partner gets to talk to everybody and I don't like that either so you just will knock until I get to talk to somebody then we'll switch and you do it that way you have some kind of arrangement ahead of time you don't get to the door knock on the door and somebody comes to the door what do you want is it your turn or my turn who's going to do the talking I, you know know that figure that out ahead of time but but have again have a plan to work and then work your plan oh time's about up let me give you about two more things quickly out of this list of 32 points. Don't push the sinner beyond his understanding or, or beyond his limits. Don't try to... Now, here's somebody struggling. They, they just can't come to grips with the fact that they're a sinner. They just can't come to grips with the fact... Maybe they've admitted to you that they're a sinner, but, man, they just can't, they cannot see themselves going to hell. They just won't admit that. They can't see that. They deny that. Don't be in such a rush and in such haste to make a convert or, or seemingly to win a convert that you're going to go ahead and try to coerce them into praying with you anyway if, if they don't get it, if it doesn't click. You're not going to win anybody. And you may be giving them a false hope based on a prayer that you pray with them. So you don't push somebody beyond their understanding or beyond their limits. If they're not interested, they're not interested. If they don't understand, you do your best to, to help them to understand how can I accept some man should guide me so you want them to understand. But they still, at the end of the night, they still may not understand. And you're not going to win anybody to Christ that way. You've got to know when, when you've done all you can do. If I get to Revelation 21.8 in the gospel, and, and I point to that and, and all liars, and a little while ago you just told me you told a lie, right? Or, yeah. Well, according to the word of God, then, if you died right now, where's the Bible say you'd have to go? Well, I'd go to heaven. Well, if they're going to stick to that, well, I don't know where I'd go. Well, look what the Bible says. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So you, you've explained that to them, but yet still you can't get beyond that. I'm not going to say, well, okay, well, let me show you the good news. Because they, they haven't understood the bad news first. So if that's as far as they'll go. If, if they will not admit to being a sinner, if they will not admit 
that they're in danger of hell. There's no sense telling them how to, how to escape it. If they don't see the danger, there's nothing to escape. I'm maybe have a word of prayer with them, hand them a track, I'm going to move on. Maybe I'll stop by and see again sometime. You know, and leave them there. You're a whole lot better off leaving them dangling over Revelation 21.8 over the lake of fire. Let them meditate on that, ponder that for a while, and maybe come back at a later time and, and after the Holy Spirit of God's had a chance to work and convict than you are just trying to rush through and get a sinner's prayer just so you can come back to the bus and say you got one. So be careful of that. Don't push them beyond their understanding or their endurance. Yes, ma'am. You say, well, you know, been nice meeting you, nice visiting with you. We got to go. We got some other folks. We got to we got to contact. So, oh, he's pointing to the microphone. The question was, if you can't get somebody to admit that they're a sinner or that they're lost on their way to hell, how do you graciously close out the conversation? Well, again, you just you just say, well, you know, been nice meeting you, nice visiting with you. Appreciate your time. We got some other folks we got to see tonight. You know, maybe we can get by see you again. God bless you. Can we have a word of prayer with you? You know, just. However, you just excuse yourself. You don't, you know, go away down the sidewalk going, you're going to hell, just remember that. You know, uh, I mean, to each his own, but that's not the recommended approach that I'd use. Well, it's chapel time, so I'll let Dr. Lewis know how much we did not get accomplished this morning, but I think we got a lot accomplished in spite of that. <laughs>